Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the Benicia Unified School District to order. We are going to begin this evening real quickly with the pledge. Um, we do not have anything to report out with student session this evening. So I see our new council member, Lionel Esparga, sitting in the audience. Would you, everybody, please stand? And Lionel, would you lead us in the pledge? To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And everyone, please be seated. Okay, I'd like to call for an approval of the agenda, please. I need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Do I have a second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Hearing none, the agenda is approved as written. Okay, moving on to the consent calendar. I will need a motion for the consent calendar as well. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the board to be routine and will be approved by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion on these items unless members of the board, staff, or public request specific items to be pulled or, and discussed. Are there any comments, questions? Seeing none and hearing none, I'm gonna call for a motion. Well, the consent calendar as presented. Do I have a second? second that. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, it passes. Okay, at this time, I would like to um, call on our superintendent to honor our outgoing trustees, and then we will begin the swearing in process, the oath of office. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody for uh, coming out this evening for this uh, special event. And um, th this is very much a special event. This is, I think the second time uh, I've done this in uh, now my fourth year as superintendent. And I just want to make a few comments about our two special people that are leaving us that I just want to let everybody know, and certainly the trustees, um, what, what um, an act of generosity it is to step forward as a community member to commit your time and your efforts and your thought and your passion about one of the most important things that a society does is to have a high quality education system for all of its kids. Uh, it's, it's very, very important work. It's vital to the Republic. And um, I just wanna thank all of you that are here and the two new ones that will be joining us. We'll get to you in a little while. So just wanna thank you for that. A really great act of generosity, so thank you. And I wanna thank um, Peter Morgan, who's uh, been a trustee with us for five years and uh, done an absolutely terrific job, and I've really enjoyed uh, getting to know you, and you brought just a great intellectual acumen to the work and a, um, a depth of knowledge that's helped us along the road and real passion for it too, so thank you. And I'd um, like to thank uh, Celeste Manette. This is her second year with us and stepped in and uh, fin finished out a, um, uh, an opening, and you've done a, a really terrific job, and I've loved our conversations together and all that you've learned along the way, a lot of eye-opening sort of experiences uh, for you. And uh, both of you, thank you. And it's it's a lot of work and you know, good, trustworthy, loyal, wonderful, thoughtful people. And uh, we're, we're indebted to you. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'd also just like to take a moment and say thank you to both of you. I've learned so much from both of you. Um, your compassion and your, your zest and love for children and education has been absolutely inspiring. And I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to work with you together. So thank you. I just want to echo what they said and just, um, I've learned so much on finance and stuff from you, Peter, and, and just your long friendship and everything. Just thank you for that. And Celeste, just your, your heart of gold for the kids and arts and Thank you for both of you just stepping up and just willing to be a board member. Thank you. Do you have any any um, any parting words of wisdom for us? We do have somebody from so a couple of things. Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does it count in the comment yet? That's it. Go. No, I just like to thank you and and everyone who works in the district for all you do for our children, for my children. I still have children in the district. We'll have children in the district for six more years at least. And um, the district is an important part of our life in the family. And uh, so uh, I wish you. I'll be rooting for you, and I wish you all the success. Um, I I echo that, and also just um, appreciate that opportunity to serve. 
um, my community and um, to put in what I felt like was a good shot at doing my civic duty to participate. Um, I learned a ton. Um, it was amazing. <laughs> my son's laughing at me. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I, um, I've met so many people and worked with you all that are all so committed um, to really furthering um, and supporting our kids, which to me is the most important thing. And also thanks to my kids who are standing back there who dealt with me coming home late Thursday nights and who are also like um, my, con well, my connections to the schools, really. And then my mom, who's there with a bouquet, this is so sweet. My mom is um, 76 and she's on the planning commission in the city of St. Helena. Oh. And she's uh, been a political activist and um, a very active member in her community government. And she's a good role model, I think, for me and for my kids and for all the kids here in terms of being involved in the democratic process. So anyway, but thank you. Thank you. So uh, what we'd like to do, but I do have a speaker. We're going to do pictures in just a moment. Uh, but we do have um, a representative from Supervisor Brown's uh, office, Stephen Hallett, who would like to come in and, and recognize our outgoing trustees. So welcome. So to trustees Morgan and Monette, thank you for your service. I know that it is not easy to step up and take the public criticism and to deal with the complaints, but I know it's also very rewarding. You served your community well, and I thank both of you. On behalf of Supervisor Brown, I have certificates of appreciation for both of you. And to um, Trustee Fer Ferrucci, I got that right, thank you, <laughs> thankfully. <Yeah. laughs> and to uh, Zeta and Maselli, congratulations on your election victory, and thank you for stepping up to serve Benicia. I wish all of you well. Anyone we'll do pictures right now? Why don't, why don't you come forward and we'll do pictures? So, what the, the outgoing trustees? I have. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think uh, you're you're you you are excused. You are excused. Thank you. Oh, but if you want to hang around after, we can have a little celebration after we swear in our new trustees. You're more than welcome to stay, obviously. Okay, so for the sake of you in the audience, let me just explain real quickly. We are going to have our county superintendent, Lizette Estrada Henderson, is back with us again tonight, and she is going to issue the oath of office for um, Sherry Zeta, Mark Maselli, and myself. I will need to be sworn in again as well. Um, we'll do some pictures. We have a certificate, and then we're going to um, close the meeting, and we'll be having a little reception, which we'll all hope you'll all join in for. Um, so, are we ready? Okay, so Superintendent. Do I come up now? Okay. Okay, very good. Yes, please. <laughs> Absolutely. So for the oath of office, I will ask you to raise your right hand 
And then I will ask you to state your name, and then we will go through the oath, okay? So, I, I state your name, Jerry do solemnly swear or affirm, solemnly swear or affirm that, I will support and defend that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, the of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic, all enemies, foreign and domestic that, I that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter, with the authority granted to me by the Constitution of the State of California, I proclaim you duly elected and installed to assume the duties as a member of the governing board of the Benicia Unified School District. At this Okay, at this time we will adjourn for a quick reception. And so cupcakes and stuff over on your left or our right. And we will re-adjourn, we will restart our meeting at 7.30. Thank you. Good evening. I am going to reconvene the meeting, and I am going to welcome our new board members to the dais with us, Mr. Maselli and Mrs. Zeta. And we'll let our meeting get going. Just before we get started, though, I would just like to thank my family, who has been a tremendous support for the last four years. And you got four more to go. Um, and I want to. I want to also tech, check, um, thank my two little supporters that are here, Dominic and Dylan. They are two of my grandchildren, and they, I think, my biggest fans, and they are also who I go and volunteer in the classrooms with every week. So I just want to thank them for being here. You're getting a good lesson in civic responsibility tonight. So, all right, but you did guys. They get a cupcake? They, right. they got cupcakes. <laughs> they got cupcakes. <laughs> so I just want to thank them. They're real troopers, and they're part of why we're still doing what we're doing, even though my children have gone through the system. So thanks, guys. All right, now we're going to get moving, and we are on to we are on to our organizational part of the board meeting. So I'm just going to give a little description of what each of the sections are as we go. Typically in December, um, what's unique about this meeting is that we kind of reorganize. We pick we pick our leads or our president and our clerk, who is the person who gets to sign everything. According to our board policy, these positions are two-year terms. So with that being said, it'll just be a confirmation of our current positions. And Stacy, who had to leave for a work commitment tonight, is not here. She is our clerk. Um, and then we'll also approve our calendar of board meetings for the rest of the year that will begin again in January. Um, and that will take care of our schedule. So those are, and then we're going to look at committees. 
And before we even get to committees, I'd like to apologize to, to Sherry, because I was talking to you about a committee. When we were in our conference, we were kind of sharing all the things that we do and the different committees we get involved in. And apparently that committee is being reorganized, and they're not ready to have it come up to the board yet. So it will probably come back sometimes later, but sorry. So, okay, this is really weird, guys. I'm doing this agenda, and the first thing I need <laughs> is a confirmation of my presidency, please. So, all right, so do I have to call for a motion for this? So we do need a motion, a uh, second, right. and then an all in favor. Okay, so do I have a motion I'll to- make a motion that we um, confirm you as the president of our, of, for the next year. Do I have a second? I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. Do we have a motion to confirm the position of clerk for Stacy Hoagling? I make a motion that we confirm Stacy Hoagling as the clerk for our next season. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. All right. Now we need to look at our, the um, board meeting calendar for 2019. Yes. Yeah. Does anybody have any comments about the calendar? Have you had the chance to look at it? Okay. So most of the meetings are on the first and third Thursdays of the month. When there's a conflict due to holidays, um, those meetings might be changed. And then there are times where there's only one meeting in a month because of holidays and um, vacation time. And then also, too, just um, I think just a little note of, of information here is we do have occasionally through the school year what we call study sessions mm -hmm. when we want to delve deeper into just one topic and we want to engage in, in conversations. Those are not scheduled because we don't know how they're going to come up based on what's coming up. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So with that said, do I have an approval for the calendar? A motion to approve. <laughs> Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We're getting a little online mentoring going on quickly on the side here. Okay, so we have appointments to various committees that occur during the course of the school year that each one of us will be participating in. One is represented at Solano County School Board Association. That needs one person, and it meets twice a year. The next one is a representative to the Benicia Youth Action Coalition, and that also takes one person, and they meet, I'm probably quarterly, Monthly. Monthly. Okay, you're a busy group. And the next one is a representative to the Vallejo, um, Valero Community Advisory Committee, and that takes one board member and that meets quarterly. The next one is a representative to the Board Policy Committee. That takes two people and that meets, I'm going to say monthly because you are meeting with the superintendent and you are meeting with Mrs. Jensen. Also, there is a representative to the District Curriculum Council. That takes two board members. Also, the Facility Steering Committee, which takes two members, and we're discussing board pro um, bond projects at that committee. And then also a, li a liaison to the Benicia Ed Foundation, which takes one person. So Stacy is not here, Mrs. Jensen. Has she? She did tell me what she wanted to do. Well, and I wrote it somewhere. <laughs> okay. Um, she wanted to hold on. Sorry. Okay. So, do you guys have any preference for things you'd like to do? You're shaking your head. Yes, Stacy. Mm -hmm. Push it so the light's green. Okay. Um, I was looking, or it was recommended that I be a member of the board policy, representative of the board policy. Um, and maybe the um, the wellness committee when it comes back, and you know that we're using that committee again, and possibly to the the liaison for the Benicia Education Foundation. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. She asked to be on the facilities steering committee, and um, also the Bolero Community Advisory. I would. 
assume that there are certain positions that you guys have held. Uh, so what I'm thinking is I'd like to see where there's a need and I'd like to fill on, in on whatever uh, committees there is a need for. Okay. Thanks. I don't, I don't want, you know, you guys have things that you're comfortable with. Well, Diane, why don't we just start with the top one and who wants to be a rep for the Solano County School Board Association? I can tell you a little bit more about that. Yeah. Would you please? So um, the Solano County obviously has their own school board and um, they have a joint meeting with the county uh, board members, the representatives. Um, it is It fluctuates when it actually is because one of the th things that you'll do is plan a dinner with a speaker um, a few times a year and different uh, districts are in charge of that. When you're in charge of it, you'll have more meetings, but most of them are by phone or they uh, they could be, you know, on, on the web. Um, but then when you're not planning the dinner, then it's less meetings. So it's very hard to tell you how many meetings. I will tell you that we are due for one of the dinners because we were supposed to do December and I didn't. So we'll be the next dinner. So you'll have a little bit more planning and it's planning, you know, the place and I assist you, the place, the speaker, the caterer, all of those things. And then that becomes your meeting. So the commitment is fluctuates. Understood. And those are evening. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Normally Mondays or yes. is that? Usually Mondays at 530 oh. is what they were okay. meeting. Monday's before. the only night that school boards don't meet. So that's why it's Mondays. Is there someone that has been on that committee prior to this? Um, it was Peter. Well, I'd, I'd be glad to do that if there's not, you know, like I said, I'd like to fill in where there's a need. That would be great. I'd also like to, um, I'd like to continue with district curriculum and the facility. That's where I have been working and I feel like I've I have a real commitment to that. I've been there for four years. The other one I would like to pick up is the Valero. I've I filled in for Peter for the last two meetings, um, and I I would like to continue that commitment. So that's the one that Stacy had um, mm -hmm. expressed interest in, but it's it's she's probably fine with you taking that. So just just an aside, because one of the she reasons I started subbing for Peter was because they've moved the meetings to 3.30 in the afternoon. Right. I don't think she's aware of that. Yeah. So why don't we put you down, and then I can tell her that she can be an alternate. That would be great, because there, the, it there's does no need a There's no reason why you both can't go. No, right. there actually is none. And it, it's, it's a good... It's a good uh, um, meeting with them. It's mm -hmm. you learn a lot about operations, but also the relationship between Valero and and the school district and Valero and the well. And what was I have a report to share when we get to report time. But what also what I didn't realize when I went to the first meeting, which was October, and then I went last um, Wednesday night. Um, it's also the city members that are there. So police and fire are there. There is a council member on the board, and the city manager is there. So it's it's far greater than um, than just with Valero. And actually, our last conversation was about the flare up that occurred in May, and since that point, they've been talking about a communication system that would include the school, not not just the city and Valero, but you've got to notify the school because that was where we fell down the last time. So Can I make a quick quick comment. So sure. I know we're right early on in this. So, so far, so we have seven committees. So, so far we have uh, Diane, uh, um, Trustee Ferrucci is interested in me on Valero. And if, uh, you know, Ms. Holguin, uh, if she wants to do it as well. So we've got one person there. Um, the board policy review committee, we need two folks on we that. We need two. And that, that meets uh, monthly. Mm -hmm. And so Sherry is uh, offered to be on that. Uh, and then what do we have? So we don't have anybody curriculum. Uh, Diane, uh, Trustee Ferrucci, curriculum council. But we need a second person. You need a backup there. Okay. Yeah, I have to pull away from that one because that, they meet the same time as my as BYEC. I'll be the rep to BYEC since I'm the chairman of that group. Um, I could I could wear two hats, sir. Okay. Unless and somebody else wants to join too, and that's always fine. All right. So the curriculum, and then the two other ones that the facility steering committee meet, meets once a month. We're um, 
think we're like in the at do we noon to one or two? well well it's the afternoon generally and right. I talked to Roxanne and she said um actually because the bond monies are pretty much settled that you may not be meeting as often okay um Maybe, maybe. And so that, that's uh, I've really enjoyed that committee mm -hmm. because we've got that you know 150 million dollars facilities master plan at a 50 million dollar bond, and you know lots of good decisions have been made. But I've been really appreciated having uh, two trustee trustees on it, uh, Trustee Wing and Ferrucci. So if we can continue to have two, I think that would be great. And then B BEF uh, meets uh, once a month in the mm -hmm. evening from seven to about nine. And Sherry, you volunteered for that, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Jerry for a BEF. Yes. Yeah. If there's anything that meets during the day, that's not possible. Right. Okay. Um, Is the BYAC in the afternoon? Yeah. yeah. We fourth Wednesday every month at three thirty. Is that something? I don't know if you're still interested in that. I wonder with your work schedule, if that's something you'd be able to make. I'm not. I can't leave until three forty. Yes, yeah, so I'll stay on it. Okay. Also because I'm the chairman of that group. Oh, well, that would help. So, Dr. Young, we still need one more rep for the board policy committee. Yes. We do need to. What time does that meet at? Aaron? It's Any? flexible because we set that, um, but it needs to be during work hours. What are your work hours? Till 4.30 or 5.00 or whenever. How long is the meeting? It's, I try to keep it to an hour at the most. I could be back by three thirty on the meeting. Yeah, we could do. We could totally. Any other day except Wednesday, I could be back by three thirty. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So that so we've got the board policy committee filled with um, uh, Trustee Maselli. Mm -hmm. And okay. And so that so that one's good. So we still need a second person for facility. Or Stacy's going to do that one. Okay, so we're good on facility. And then curriculum. Do, wait, do we need one more person for the facility steering? Uh, myself yeah. and Stacey. Okay, good. All right. Does and, anyone else want to join her? We can have two. We don't have to. And that one means is fine. That, Dr. That three, three thirty. Three thirty. And I can't be on that one anymore. Can we do one? We can do one. We can do one. All right. All right. So it looks like we're covered. Um, Gary, you're BY, uh, trust, um, yes. you're, you're the BYAC. Oh, you got it. BYAC. And then uh, Trustee Marcella, you're going to the BPRC. Um, and then we'll, we'll do that in a way that you'll be able to, to make that with the work schedule. Okay. And he's also going to do Solana School Board, right? Yes. Okay. That's right. So if you have, um, if you're clear on who's doing what, then we uh, just need these approved. Okay. Are we all set? Sherry, you have three as well. Is that that's what I'm coming up with? Um, is once, that correct? once the wellness what, uh, once it's back? Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're good. Okay. You want to make a motion to? Can I have a motion that we approve all the board appointments for the committee? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you. That passes. All right. Now we're going to move on to report. So typically what we do is our students from our high schools will share highlights or special events coming up. Tonight we only have Benicia High, not that we only have Benicia High School, but, we have, <laughs> but Benicia High School is here. We don't have our Liberty student this evening. Also, the superintendent will talk to us about um, any district highlights that might be going on or events that he may want us to know that we may want to participate in. And then also the board members also make a report out. It's, it's not that we give our calendar of what we've done, but we try to share with you as our other as our colleagues where we've gone, where we have represented the team by having a board member present so that but there's a lot of school events going on. There's no way we could hit them all, but we try to make sure we highlight those for everyone. And it lets the community know what, what right. their elected officials are doing. So. Right, exactly. Okay, so with that said, I am going to turn over to Benicia High School to our student. Good evening. Hello, I'm Amanda Ajari, the Benicia High School ASB president, and I'm here to report on what we've been doing. So this past week, we started Wellness Week, and it's to help kids de-stress for finals coming up next week. So Monday, we had Bob Ross Day, where we all had hand painting, and we made a Christmas tree out in the quad. The next day on Tuesday, we had teen scones out in the quad for everyone. Yesterday was yoga in our dance room. And today, 
we had a movie during lunch in our and to our new um, movie room. And then tomorrow we have an ugly sweater contest, <laughs> and we also have swing dancing, I believe, in the quad. And then Monday and Tuesday we have study study groups or study sessions in our L two L three buildings. And then upcoming, we have our talent show, which is January twenty fifth, twenty sixth. Um, and then we also are currently holding adopt a family at the high school, where the teachers can come in and choose a family that needs help um, with giving gifts to their students, and we deliver those gifts to those families on next Friday. And that's it for Finnish. Thank you. Very nice, thank you very much. All right, I am gonna also dismiss our student because I'm thinking you might have some homework to get done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your time. Good night. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna turn to Superintendent Young. Thanks. I had uh, just a few slides I'd like to share with everyone, and I think that the first few of these focus on uh, one of these beautiful elements of the Benicia community, about uh, partners, partnerships with the school district and the community. So the first one that was this nice event, could you go back really quick, uh, was uh, working with the tree planting with the Benicia Tree Foundation. So these are wonderful folks uh, that partner with us. They've planted a number of trees throughout the district over the years. So this is a really fun event on a cold day. Uh, over at uh, Farmer and uh, talked to some of the teachers and they had spent some time, you know, prepping the kids on this and talking to them and what it meant and a representative came out and talked to them about that. So this is right by the um, the backstop there. So they, you know, prepped it and planted it and I think the kids had a good time there. Um, another nice event that we had and uh, Dr. Beetson was involved with this as well. There's a, a wonderful person in town, Jan Rodensky, Rodensky who is an artist and she told me that this effort, which also includes, you know those um, energy boxes throughout town? Uh, that it's, I think she said it's taken 20 years to, to go through a process to uh, have a committee to be able to, to, to you know, to paint those. And, and then and they had this effort where she worked with uh, Dr. Beetson and myself and the schools to put it out there to kids to see if they wanted to uh, paint and draw for us. And so here are some of our students. And I think they were all from the middle school. Correct, so. and, and uh, we had this wonderful event where the mayor came out and the city councilman Young came out, and there, there's Miss Radeski uh, with the, with the children's beautiful um, artwork, and it's right by Farmer uh, on on that side of the street there. So we're very happy with that event. Another wonderful event we had, which also speaks to the culture that you know continued to build with the district in and of ourselves, and you know partnering with the community around, around partnerships. So one of the things that Principal Kleinschmidt and I had been talking about for a while, I think, and a number of other people uh, about modernizing and give, giving the library an uplift. So, Ms. Kleinschmidt uh, was a, is a force of nature, mm -hmm. and working with her uh, PTA and, and with us on, on our end, we were able to modernize that space considerably. With uh, and you can just tell there. I mean, this is a space that had not been modernized in I think 30 years. The furniture was, I think, from 1969. So I think we got a good return on the investment uh, with that. So we've got new carpet, um, new furniture. We had an opening two days ago, and it was, it was just beautiful. And, uh, One ahead. of the nice things about that is she tweeted out over the summer that she needed help, and she had a handful of students who came down, and they spent a week or so down there just tearing stuff out, removing stuff. The maintenance guys went down, and and cut out the forest in the back and there's actually walls back there it's not just all greenery and did a bunch of work and and i mean they, yeah we did it, we were it able was to use a, our own, uh, a total effort by everybody so. a great partnership You're right. You're absolutely right those two it's a really a great space if you get a chance to check it out there's these two outdoor spaces and they cleaned them all out and they one of them is very zen with the fountain that our guys built and it's just it's just gorgeous when I was in there the other day and kids were on the furniture and loving it and doing the homework and just really appreciating it. So that's that's a space that's, you know, commensurate with the needs of our kids. So hats off to us and Ms. Kleinsmith. Uh, the artist, uh, paint, uh, she painted a mural on that wall for us. Her name is Carrie Lee. Uh, and uh, there she is standing next to Ms. Kleinsmith. And there's the artwork in the background, which is really beautiful. And it's um, a dream catcher. And she had an activity where and we, you could write a dream in one word on a on a leaf and then you would hang it next to the feather so she's got a little more work to do on that um, but we want to thank her for that effort too some of the other work i wanted to point out really quick uh, dr beaton and working with our wonderful teachers we went through the negotiations process and one of the things that we 
agreed on was taking a look at the teacher um, development and growth process. Uh, and so we're working with a model, it's called the Danielson model. It's just administrators and teachers working with Melissa, Linton. Melissa Linton, uh, who works, I guess, for the Danielson Foundation. And she's come in and spent some really good time with us talking about that evaluation teacher growth system, what it looks like and how we would implement it. So that, that was a great day. And hats off to Dr. Beetson organizing all of it. I just put this up there because I was in, uh, you know, dropped into both of the teacher sessions. I want to thank all the teachers for coming to that. But she started off one of the sessions I thought was great as a, you know, focus questions for teachers to think about uh, and getting into the conversation about this very complex and important work that teachers do every day with kids. And I just wanted to point it out to you that if you were in a classroom, went into a classroom, what might you see or hear there from the students as well as the teacher that would cause you to think that you were in the presence of an expert? And what would you see and hear that would make you think, oh, this is good. If I had a child of this age, I would want my child in this class. And so she posed those questions to teachers and uh, they had an opportunity to reflect on it. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't stay for what, what folks said I would have liked to, but I thought those are nice focusing questions. So we'll continue to do that work. And I just want to finish my comments very briefly by pointing out the, the important work that I want us to continue to do as a, as a, as a school district uh, around culture. Uh, and culture is our deeply held beliefs about how we like to work together, our deeply held beliefs about our kids and what we expect of them, what we'd like to do for them. And I just want to spend a minute refreshing ourselves of this document that you see up on the wall here that I worked through. I think it was my second year and we had a committee to put together this vision statement, some of our beliefs as an organization. And this other part of it is what we would like our Benicia graduates to look like when they leave us. So briefly, our vision statement, we're all students achieve at their highest potential in an engaging, inspiring, and challenging learning environment. And then on the next slide, that's too small for me to read. Um, <laughs> but I, I, if you just bear with me, I do want to read them. So these are these beliefs that we, that we all hopefully hold dear on behalf of our students and our relationship with them and one another in the community. So just briefly, we believe that students reach their potential when they are engaged, encouraged, challenged, and supported in the pursuit of their interests, passions, and talents. We believe all students are creative, unique, and can learn. Uh, we believe education is a, is a collaborative effort among students, staff, parents, guardians, and the community. We believe in valuing the diversity of students, staff, and the community. We believe every student has a voice that deserves to be heard. Dr. Beetson in her committee yesterday, I was visiting the curriculum council meeting they were talking about voice. Uh, we believe safe and welcoming schools help students and staff reach their potential. We believe educational experience for students and staff are continually improved through systems of accountability. And we believe education must be purposeful, challenging, and innovative. And, and, that, and that's a lot. And I, and I think that those are robust beliefs that act as our North Star as we continue to partner together to do great work on behalf of our very deserving students. So some comments from your superintendent. Again, I'd like to welcome our new trustees. We're excited for you, for you to be here. And just for the audience to know briefly, there's a conference we have every year called California School Boards Conference. It's my favorite conference because we get to go as a whole governance team. And we spent a couple of days there together doing lots of learning and, and lots of getting to know each other. So I thought that was good, time well spent. It was. Thank you. Very much so. You're welcome. So welcome to all of you and thank all of you for coming. All right, thank you. So with that said, are there any board members who would like to make a report? Mr. Wing. <laughs> um, the superintendent already did it, so <laughs> yeah, that was it. So great opportunity, a lot of uh, good classes to take at the School Board Association uh, Conference and, and um, a lot of good input plus opportunity to, to learn a little bit more about our new board members and so it was a, a good, enjoyable time. So, thank you. All right, I'm just going to go real quickly. I did represent us at that open house the other night over at the library, and I just want to, I think, a big shout out to all of the partners that engaged in the work at that library. It was amazing, and seeing the kids coming in 
and seeing their reaction and some of them sitting right outside too. Could you believe it or not? It was the one nice day that we had. They got to sit outside as well in the courtyard, but it was really pretty impressive. In fact, at one point, I just have to tell this little funny story. The coffee pot started to leak because Brianna had had snacks and re and um, treats for everyone, and the and Alfredo, our director of maintenance, goes racing over there to check his carpet on the floor. He's like, okay, <laughs> so he was taking care of that just to make sure his carpet didn't get messed New up. Carpet. But they did a pretty impressive job, and I was I was really amazed that our team was able to do it all in house. They didn't have to reach out for anyone, along with you know help from the community. So thank you to those who did that work. Um, lastly. Um, I did go to the Valero meeting on um, Wednesday evening, or no, Tuesday evening it was, and um, they asked me to report out to everyone that the uh, monitoring systems are now in. In fact, it was a 45-slide presentation to the community. It's December is their one community meeting that they have, and that presentation was going also to city council. Um, the minutes are pretty lengthy. I asked Mrs. Jensen today if she would share them on with you guys so you could see them. And I also now have the PowerPoint on my, on my email, so I will send that to her as well and ask her to forward it to you. Okay, so you'll get that. All right, with that said, we are going to move on to the next portion of the agenda, number 14. It's comments from the public. This is an opportunity for the public to address any concerns or questions that they may have of us that we actually have in our jurisdiction. They might be on the agenda. They might not be on the agenda. Our role is to listen. If we have questions or we want some clarifications, we need to direct it to our superintendent who could come back at a later time and give us some further information, but our role is not to engage with the speakers, but just to let them talk and share their information with us. So with that said, all right, going on to this portion of the agenda, members of the public, you may address the board at a regular meeting on any item within the board's jurisdiction. Cards may be completed requesting to address the board. They are available at the back table and may be submitted to the board secretary at the meeting. The governing board allows speakers to speak at regular meetings on agendized and non-agendized matters under public comment. Comments are limited to no more than three minutes per speaker. By law, no action may be taken on any item raised during the public comment periods, and matters may be referred to staff for placement on a future agenda of the governing board. Okay, so with that said, I have five speakers um, in front of me. Kai Wills. And, and back of Kai will be Lisa Mamaki, is that right? And then Brian Wills. And then I'll call the next two after that. Is Brian here as well? Okay. Uh, All right, Kai. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Kai Wills. Uh, I'm a freshman at Benicia High School. Um, I, sh I play tennis. I've been playing tennis for many years. Um, and it's tough to play on those courts. They, they're really slippery. Um, they're not well done. It's very easy to crack to slip on the cracks on those courts. Um, it's not very safe to play on those courts. I, whenever I go out to hit, which is three, four days a week, I, I can't really go there. It's, um, they're just not very good courts. Um, and I would support the idea of resurfacing them. And I know that a lot of money was given to support that. Um, and I don't know, I think that they should resurface the courts. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa? Um, hi, my name is Lisa. I am in eighth grade at the Benicia Middle School. Um, like Kai said, the courts are very unsafe, to be honest. Um, I went out to play over the summer with my friend, Nathan Tab Tab, who's actually a um, graduate of Benicia High School and is at UC Davis currently. And uh, I almost fell a couple of times. And, the courts are uneven, so they're like have bumps, so it messes up the play. Nor like, and it also messes up like how you play. So you're used to playing on these courts that aren't flat, or they have a weird spin, or they just aren't the best. And when you go to play somewhere else, you play so different. Like everything's different, and everything's more complicated, and 
I love to play with my friends and my family just out on the courts and have fun and be together with, as a community because we're a small town and it's a tight community and everyone knows everyone and it'd be fun just to have fun out there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Brian Wills. And then behind Brian will be Ronnie and JoJo. Uh, good evening. My name is Brian Wills. Uh, first, congratulations and good luck. Thank you. Uh, truly appreciate that you're giving your time and your energy to, to do what you're doing. Um, uh, really, truly appreciate it. Again, I'll follow up on the tennis topic. Um, parent of two children. Uh, one of which started in 2005 at Joe Henderson as a kindergartner and just recently graduated is off to UC Santa Cruz. So thank you very much. I'm very happy that that's happened. Uh, the first speaker, Kai Wills, is obviously my son. And as he's a freshman at the high school, concerned about those tennis courts, tennis season will be starting up next season. Obviously, I'm sure things don't happen overnight, uh, but sometime during his tenure at the high school, would sincerely appreciate seeing something done to those, to those courts. Uh, my wife and I also play tennis. We're part of the uh, Benicia Community Tennis Association. We've done our time, we put in our membership dues. We've been a part of the fundraising that the BCTA has done to help resurface those courts in years past. Uh, so where there's control for that funding to be pushed into the courts and uh, deal with some very, very deferred maintenance would be sincerely appreciated. So appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank Ronnie. I'm going to try to keep this under three minutes. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Ronnie Anchetta, and I'm here to ask the board to make the BMS and BHS tennis courts a top priority. Uh, your current priority involves putting up a partial wall in front of the Benicia Middle School, so that way we can deter and funnel some potential intruder to come through one access point which in my opinion is absurd. Oftentimes when I think of walls that prevent bad people from entering, I automatically think of the White House fence. Despite security measures as a fence, there still have been some people who have managed to gain unauthorized access to the White House. This is supposedly to be one of the most secure places in the country, yet it did not prevent someone from getting in. I'm pretty sure the same type of people that recommended an impenetrable fence around the White House is convincing us that we can have one too at BMS. I believe creating a wall just offers a false sense of security and, promo and promoting paranoia. Furthermore, what if the bad person didn't come from the outside but was a student in the inside? What the, call, what the wall can try to keep out, the wall can also keep in. I personally prefer to be the fight in front of the BMS by improving the landscaping and adding more benches for the students. This way, we can still have enough money for the tennis courts. Many years ago, I moved from Daly City to American Canyon and then to Benicia. I heard of the schools to be so much better here in Benicia that I knew that I wanted my children to go to school here. I was not concerned about how the school looked like, but was more interested in its curriculum, the sport activities, and its teachers. Tennis is now part of my children's activities, and I would like to have your support. I want to remind the board why I moved to Benicia in the first place. Let us not forget a school is nothing without great students and educators. Let us not get too focused on building a wall. The high school tennis team and the Benicia Middle School tennis program needs your support. They need new tennis courts they can safely play on and proud to call their own. The boys and girls Benicia high school tennis team are all around champions, doing part of the collective efforts of the Benicia Community Tennis Association uh, they have contributed in developing the, the Benicia Middle School Tennis Program, preparing students to play competitively by the time they get to high school, and provided improvements to the, to, the, to the Benicia High School Tennis Courts by adding benches and buying caps for the boys' tennis team. I believe the Benicia High School seems to be riding on the coattails of the Benicia Tennis Association and not doing anything to promote the sport. So please help the students get new tennis courts. Thank you. Thank you. Jojo? Jojo Donetti, Benicia Community Tennis Association. At the last board meeting when Trustee Monette asked 
the Measure S program manager and the master architect about fixing the middle school tennis courts. The response was to the effect that putting in prefab classrooms would serve more students and thus the courts were dropped from being a priority too. Think about that. Earlier in that meeting, you heard from Galen Anchetta, a seventh grader at the middle school, who told you that every PE student is on those courts every day. They run every day over those cracks. They run over the surface that's decayed. They run against the fence that has wires poking out at them. So my question to you is, who uses that facility more? I think it's the kids on the tennis courts, not the prefab classrooms. One more thing for you to ponder. With childhood obesity rates at staggering numbers, does it make sense to continue to neglect the tennis courts, to continue to not provide a safe environment for the kids to play on and to be active, be it with tennis, pickleball, or just running? Or does it make more sense to build a rock wall because the master architect, in his own words, could not figure out the entrance to the middle school. A rock wall that the kids are gonna climb on, gonna fall off of, and somebody's gonna break their arm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make a request of Superintendent Young, if you guys don't mind. Um, we have not had a board update in a while on our facilities. I'd like to see us, if everybody's in agreement, get a bond update, not a board update, bond update to the board yeah. within the next month or so with our meetings. I don't know where we are on our calendar rotation, but I think it would be good to have one. And we could talk about the things that are, are covered and what our next steps are. We'd be happy to do that. Great. Thank you. Okay. Is everybody in agreement with that? Yes. Okay, now we're going to move on to discussion items. These, um, the discussion items on our agendas are items where staff will be making a presentation to us. There'll be no motion being requested of us at this time. It's basically information. And it's also a great opportunity for us to engage in a conversation, ask some questions, get some clarity so that we know who talk, who, uh, who's talking and what the topic is. And our first discussion is going to be with Dr. Beetson. Thank you. Uh, welcome, new board members. Thank you. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, do this presentation for you this evening. It is on the California Dashboard Accountability Measures. So earlier this year, I presented, uh, Ms. Rice and I presented on how our schools performed on the state test, the Smarter Balanced Assessment. And when we presented that information, it was basically what percentages of students met the standard, exceeded the standard, and so on. This dashboard just got released last week publicly, and it takes into account not only how we do on our statewide assessments, but many other um, required indicators or priorities that the state sets. Hold on. Hold on. Hmm. There we go. Um, so I'm going to take some time and go through what this all means and how we read it and, and what it means for us. Um, but when we get to the state assessment, one of the things, and I'll, I'll remind you when we get to those slides as well, that we have to remember is that it's not based on percentages met anymore. It's about how, student, how far students and groups of students are from met. And so it's called the distance from met. And it's a color-coded system. So anyway, we have uh, state accountability in eight areas. They're called the LCFF, Local Control Funding Formula Priority Areas. The ones in the green are our state indicators. And so that's where our dashboard comes in. So we get uh, accountability measures on our academic indicators, which are our state assessments, our pupil engagement, which are chronic absenteeism and graduation rates, school climate, which looks at suspension, course access for all students. So that looks at um, how do different groups of students access courses in our school district. And it's looked at through college and career readiness as our student outcomes um, as part of college and career readiness. 
Um, there's a link. I'm not going to go to it now, but I'm happy to do another presentation if, if you would so like. But over to the right where it says link to visual charts for college and career readiness. In order for the state to tell us that we are prepared for college and career, there are lots of um, ways to do that. So for instance, you could be prepared if you get a uh, you meet the standard on both the English and the math assessment for high school. You can be prepared if you do a CTE pathway and meet standard on one of the assessments. So there's lots of these, this and that or this. Um, so lots of, I always think of them as buttons. Um, and that based on how our students do, meeting all of those different criteria. A to G is another one. Um, passing AP tests and meeting standards is another one. So lots of different ways to be deemed prepared as for college and career. And stop me at any point if you have questions, because it's going to be information overload. The, um, the gray indicators on the right are local. We, do ju we just do a self-assessment locally and uh, on those, those topics. Um, so our whole goal in accountability is to get to green. It's a five color uh, rating system. Red, not good. Orange, yellow, green, and blue. The good thing about this accountability system that is different than the one that we had years ago with the CST is that it is a growth model. So in the, in the past, you had to make a certain jump in achievement in order to be um, said that you met your accountability standard. And here you get credit, if you will, for just make, not just, but for making growth, even if you don't make a next targeted area, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the accountability indicators, like I said, they're not a percentage, but they're based on the average of uh, scale scores of students um, and how far away they are from the standard met. And it's all based on what's called status and change. So how did we do this year? That's our status. And what was the change? Did we go up or did we go down from last year? And in some cases, it's a multiple, multiple year indicator. So for graduation rate at a comprehensive high school, they look at how many students started in ninth grade and graduated in four. This year, our alternative high school is involved in this. They're, they're just rolling out the accountability for um, alternative high schools, which is different because they recognize that it needs to be. And so that's a one-year graduation. <clears throat> yeah. Any questions so far? A, a huge piece of the accountability system is our assessments and just some reminders of things that help us influence and have major impact on how students do an assessment. So we always are looking at what are our instructional priorities and do we have curriculum alignment? What are our assessment practices? And do they mirror what the assessment is asking kids to do so that they have practice with items that sound like and look like and act like what's on the assessment? What is our classroom and testing environment like, our teacher attitude towards the assessment, um, and our demographics? So all of those five things have some major impact on how we do on the assessment. So... Um, <clears throat> For those of you that have been on the board or have been following this accountability system, it did change a little bit from last year. In the past, um, you had circles that looked like the trivial pursuit pies that told us if we how we were doing, and those uh, were confusing, and so they've changed them to gauges, so they look like gas gauges now. And so what you see here are our overall BUSD gauges. So chronic absenteeism, right now as a district, we are in yellow. Suspension is in yellow. College and career readiness had a huge jump this year for our district and we moved to blue. You can see where we are in English, math, and then our graduation rate is really high as well. English language progress, in English learner progress, we don't have a performance color because you need to have at least, at least 30 students um, to be given a color. And there is some um, strange things and we're checking in with the state because some student groups seem like we have more students and they're not showing up with a color. Um, in the green uh, link there, you can get right to the dashboard which is on the California Department of Ed website and play around if you so choose and I'm happy to take you through that. But I've 
clipped a lot of what's in there into this presentation. So not only do we um, have accountability for our district as a whole and every school site as a whole, it also goes through every student group. And so they're called equity reports. And so I'm going to take you through not every single one because we'd be here till our next board meeting probably. But um, I'm gonna look at, this is English language arts. And when you go to the dashboard on the website, you're gonna see that band across the top where it says explore by performance level. And you can see that right off the top, we have three groups in red three in orange, one in yellow, three in green, none in blue, and three in, that don't get a performance color. You see where I'm looking? There's not enough of them, right? And so then this is what the gauges look like. And you can see that our, um, our students who are Asian performed in the green, and it tells us in that little blue box that 47.5 points above standard. So they're in the green. So if you think of this as kind of the, the three, they're 45 points above standard. Though they did decline seven points from where they were last year, because remember I said this was a status and change, so it will tell us how far we moved from last year and how many students. So you can see how we performed there, excuse me, for our student groups, and then this just continues because there's many student groups. So we have some definite areas that we are focusing on. Um, our students who are African American, homeless, uh, two or more races, socioeconomically disadvantaged and Hispanic students have really um, taken some decline and so we are doing a lot of work around that as a district and trying to close that achievement gap and understand what we need to do better to serve those students. And then the same, whoops, I have to switch up here. And then the same is true for math as a district. And, and so that's the next uh, couple of slides. You can see that we have um, maintained with students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, but we have declined um, with uh, several of our student groups. We did increase with students with disabilities in math, which is a, a good thing. And then our English learners also increased in mathematics, which is excellent. And then we have three student groups in green. Am I going too fast? So Dr. Beetson, there's yes. a lot of declines. What are you attributing that to this past year? Um, well, we're going to go through the individual school. So this is us as a whole. Mm -hmm. And we're just having those conversations uh, right now. So we, we have at, at um, different school sites, we have a lot of growth. And then we are still struggling to meet the needs of those student groups. And I think that's where. Um, we need to, we're studying culturally responsive practices and universal design teaching. So I think what we need to um, continue to hone our craft at is, is not necessarily like bowling down the middle, but really looking at the students who are on the, on the edges and how do we align our curriculum better, um, get better measures for progress monitoring so that we know this along the way. So, um... If you don't mind my asking, so what I'm hearing is that we are going to get a report delineating the various sites and levels. Yep, I have that. In. Pardon? I have that in, oh, I'm in sorry. this. No, okay. that's all right. I have this in this presentation, and then you can go into the website as well if you so choose and, and look around. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, so what I did from those gauges was I did a slide that talks about our greatest progress and our greatest area of need. And I should have started by also saying that all of this information feeds into our LCAP, okay? And so uh, by LCAP rules, by accountability rules, um, anything in our greatest need, any group that's in red or orange, I need to report and, and make a statement about in our LCAP. And so that's kind of the rule of thumb I used when we put this slide presentation together. So greatest progress, um, we have uh, many groups in yellow and areas in yellow, which is excellent. And then underneath that, um, I put how they increased. So if that makes sense. So in math, for instance, our students with disabilities increased 5.4 points, and we also had three groups in the green. But overall, as a district, we're still in yellow, okay? Um, another great thing to note is that our students with disabilities graduation rate and our uh, students who are Hispanic increased quite a bit for graduation rate, which is, which is good. And then our homeless and uh, suspension declined quite a bit, which was good, because last year we were in red for that. And so we have moved those, that group quite a bit. 
Um, our next slide does show our areas of need and our orange and red groups. And so what I tried to do was indicate what, what the groups were and what happened, how much did they decline, and so forth. Um, we have in English language arts many student groups that declined pretty significantly by 20 points or more. And so we are taking a look at that and looking at our curriculum and looking at interventions that we need to put in place to make sure that we're meeting those students' needs. Um, and then the next slide, uh, I had to break it onto two. Um, I wanted to point out that we are looking at our foster youth. Um, so in the past, homeless and foster youth used to be combined and they've separated them. And so students who are in foster youth, their suspensions increased quite a bit and we need to figure out why. That just showed up. Um, so then, and I, I don't know if you want me to go through each of these, but I can just highlight a couple of things from each of the school sites. Um, and I'll start with Matthew Turner. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you can see, oh, so one of the things, the way to read this is um, math and English language arts, I've put in green font because overall, as a school, Matthew Turner is green in English and math. So that's a really good thing and yellow and red. So I've tried to do that just as a visual for you. And then um, the thing, you're welcome. Uh, greatest progress were any groups that were in blue or green or that maybe were in, um, a, either had no color or were in a lesser color, but did a significant increase. And we say five points is statistically significant. And then on the reverse areas of need, it's all the groups in red or orange, or had a major decline of five or more. Now I will say that, um, I don't wanna be confusing, but if you look at math, I have students with disabilities increased 39 points. They're not assigned a color because the students in grades three, four, or five, we don't have enough of them uh, to be assigned a color. And while it's a great increase, they're still 43 points below standard. So I also put them on the other side of the chart because this really helps our administrators and our teachers say what groups do we really need to pay attention to so I didn't want them to fall off the radar. So sometimes groups are listed on both sides um, because they've made an increase but they're not quite out of the woods yet if that makes sense. So Matthew Turner, um, it's great because it's green in ELA and math. Our students with disabilities and our uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged groups have made some great gains. And uh, particular that we wanna watch are our suspensions for our students who are Hispanic and chronic absenteeism for students with disabilities. Um, and another point is that the two things that we want to see decrease, and that's a good thing, are chronic absenteeism and suspension. So you kind of have to flip your brain a little bit because most of the time increase is good, suspensions and chronic absenteeism decrease is good. Mary Farmer, this is over two slides. Um, we are celebrating that in math overall we are green, we are yellow in English language arts, and we had significant increase with our students with disabilities and Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong. Yes, our student, our um, socioeconomically disadvantaged students and our students who are Asian had shown gro great growth. And then um, an area that we really want to pay attention to at Farmer are our students who are African American and chronic absenteeism for chronic uh, for African American students as well. Sorry, that's on this next page. Sorry about that. So it was um, ELA and math, and then chronic absenteeism shot up a little bit. Let me know if I'm going too fast. We have Joe Henderson, um, lots of green, so math, uh, and lots of student groups made some great growth in mathematics. Um, and then English language arts, we are in yellow. The, the good news is we don't have any groups at Joe Henderson in red or orange, so we, are, um, we wanna move out of yellow to be, whoops, to be solid in green. But our students with disabilities are um, socioeconomically disadvantaged groups made growth in math and English language arts. And um, on watch there are our African American students for math and English language arts. So those are, you're gonna see a pattern. And this is not just unique to Benicia, it's statewide and nationally. And we are, everywhere we go, and when we were at the school boards conference too, a lot of work around equity. And what do we need to know to remove barriers so that all kids start at the starting gate. And so that's the work that we're engaging in. Um, I think I did this slide already, whoops. 
I'm going to move two slides here at once. Okay, um, Robert Semple. Um, I'm super excited about the progress that Robert Semple has made. Uh, just so you know, Robert Semple is a Title I school that has a 44% uh, free and reduced lunch and they are making incredible growth. And um, so they're in green for all of their academic indicators and if you look, everybody's growing. So almost every single student group has grown at Robert Semple and um, so that is a real, uh, they're doing an amazing job and um, they should be very, very proud of the work that they're doing there. And then on the second page, um, Again, lots of lots of green. We are uh, in suspensions. We're we're continuing to work on that with our PBIS program, um, but looking at students who are homeless, and um, and then our chronic absenteeism as well. Venetia Middle School. Um, we are in yellow and orange, and so it is a, a, a continually conversation that we're having. Um, we are excited that our students who are white maintained and um, increased, our students who are white who are increased, and we had some students maintain. And we are looking at our student groups in both math and ELA, uh, especially African American students, homeless, and students with disabilities. And for suspensions, um, they've done some great work uh, there. We had an overall decrease in suspensions. No groups are in red. And our students who are African American decreased in suspensions by 8.2%. So that's a good um, celebration for Benicia Middle School. And then Benicia High School, uh, this is our last school. Oh, no, it's not our last school slide. I apologize. We have Liberty on here now, too. Um, I just want to make a note, and it's something I think we're trying to figure out both as a district and as a state, is how to make this test relevant for 17-year-olds. Um, so in the life of a 17-year-old in May, they are taking their SATs, or they have, they're applying to colleges, they're doing AP classes, and not that that's an excuse, but it's, it's a one more test, and so I know that the administration there is really working to try to incentivize, like let's give it this, this is an important thing for us, and we need to, to do a good job. The other thing to know is that the students haven't taken this test since eighth grade, because they take it from third grade to eighth every year, and then they don't take it again until 11th grade. Um, <clears throat> so um, we, uh, did some decline and and what has been interesting about Benicia High School is it's done some like peaks and valleys over the last few years and we're trying to look for that pattern though I will say if we look at the student this is the first year that we've been able to look at students who were in eighth grade and then took the test again as 11th graders and they maintained so that was a good thing um, the real celebration for Benicia High School comes on this next page, and if we look at college and career indicators, and remember we talked about there's lots of ways to be deemed college prepared, and we increased from 19% of our students being college and career ready to 67% of our students being college and career ready, and I think if you ask at the high school what the difference is, um, it's um, the increase in students taking CTE classes, because that's an indicator. And so we're really starting to meet the needs of kids who maybe the test is not measuring all of what their strengths and uh, abilities are. So that is a great um, thing that I want to I, I want to shout out. Ask. Um, <clears throat> I know that this was discussed in a previous board meeting. Uh, I remember the discussion about delineating, especially at the high school when they take it as eleventh graders. Not every student has had, let's say, math for example. Not every student has had the math that is going to be on the test. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to delineate the uh, information so you could see, okay, out of the students that have actually had the math that is on the test, this percentage, you know. Yes, and, and um, our teachers at the high school have done that and looked to see what percentages have done. Um, well, I'll have to think if they did that question that you're asking, but I know they've looked to see students who have taken all the levels of tests have, of course, performed much greater, and it's a conversation that we're having. Is because it, it, really it's... It's tough for students to do mm -hmm. well on a test with the information right. they've never seen. Right, because many students have only taken one. They have to take, for graduation, they have to take two years of math, but only one 
of integrated one. Mm -hmm. And then the second could be integrated two or it could be personal finance. And this test goes through integrated three. This is a quick comment there. I think it's a great, great question. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, the challenge on this part of the test, right, is I think a lot of those math questions are through I integrated three. Right. And then uh, Ms. Masoli is nodding her head over there because we've had this conversation mm -hmm. in the last, at least the last couple of years, and she and Coach T get together and they, you know, they delete, they, they uh, break the data down. Right. And sure enough, you know, logically, the kids who wind up taking integrated three do pretty well on this test. And, uh, and the kids who don't, I mean, it's just some concepts that weren't covered. Is that, is there any aspect of that in language arts or have they, has every junior covered everything that's going to be on that test? Yeah, all students have to take four years of English. And, um, you know, they do peel off and some take AP as they get into their upper grades, but they'll have at least had that level. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, Appreciate absolutely. it. absolutely. So staying with that vein, are we having some conversations about how to support students? It almost seems, I don't know, to me it seems criminal. It's not fair to test you on something when you've not had, you don't, you've not had the information you need in order to play the game. Right. And I understand that colleges are now using, starting to look at this information. Dr. Holguin's on here tonight, but she explained it to them. They're starting to use it for placement. Right. So yes, we are having when it. you're when you don't have the information because you're not put in those, you're not given the opportunity to be in those classes. I'm just wondering, is that happening at the high school? Yes, they're classes? starting to have conversations about what, what do we look at looking at the requirement and it, even if it stays at two years upping it to integrated two and what would be the impact and we have to look at how do we support our students right while we right. do that so that we don't create something that's not attainable at this moment in time because we're we've got students who are not um, being successful so yeah we're engaging in those conversations right. for sure well, I would imagine it's going to impact right on down to absolutely to the seventh grade math mm -hmm. but I think we need to look at that because we're doing our students a disservice if our requirements don't give them the opportunity to have what they need to get there. So, thank yeah, part, you. Part of that was, was that other conversation that we had a couple of years ago, and I don't know if in time we want to have it again around graduation requirements and what, and what they look mm -hmm. like. So we had that, we went through that process, and we made you know, made some adjustments. So I don't know if in time we want to come back and, and, and revisit that. I'd, I'd like to have that conversation with Dr. Beetson, and if that conversation is going to be had, what I really would like is I'd like the math teachers from the high school to come back and have that conversation with us, because I think they're best positioned. They work with the students. They work with the material. They know those tests. I think they're best positioned to help us to make that decision again. And I have to tell you, the math department at the high school is always slicing and dicing and, I know and they working That's why I, I, really hard to figure this out. I think it would so. be important to have them engaged in that. Absolutely. Um, we're almost done. Uh, so this is, the, <laughs> this is the first year we've been able to include Liberty High School because they're just creating the, it's called the DAS and Dashboard for Alternative Schools, maybe. It, I don't remember exactly what it stands for. Um, and I'm still learning about all the formulas that go behind this. But we have some data for Liberty High School. now. Keep in mind, um, they have small numbers of students in 11th grade who take the test, so most of their things don't have a color because there's not enough of them. Um, and again, relevancy is always an issue of getting kids to take the test seriously, but it is something that I know the school is very committed to. Um, we need to look at college and career because right now the only way is they can do A to G requirements or passing the test as a way to get A to G because taking a CTE class is pretty tricky because they don't we don't offer them right here right. and for them to head up to the high school their schedule might conflict so we we need to look at that um, but uh, they're working on um, behavior and with PBIS suspension rates um, are declining so that is an area that they've that, and that's a big area for a continuation high school is behavior. So on the standard for ELA and math, when they say below standard, that there's one standard. There's one standard. Regardless of who you are as yes. a student, yep. what, regardless of your school or anything. Right. Okay, thank you. So also another question for Liberty, and probably Ms. Lewis is going to explain that to us anyways when she comes up to talk about her plan. But um, Kim talked a lot about doing some activities and things with 
outside groups that are helping? Yes. yes, so we're looking at, um, and she, she will talk about this, but an internship or learning through interests um, as a way to make learning relevant for students who a traditional school setting is not working, for sure. Great, thank you. The next three, and I'm definitely not going to walk you through all of these next few slides. You've seen some of them before, but with different groups of students and administrators, we've started looking at data both when it was in the percentage form and now when it's in the accountability dashboard form and started to brainstorm a list of things. What do we need to look at? What do we need to dissect to um, make sure that we're supporting all students? And a big thing is our study of being culturally responsive and really and universal design for learning, which is a way of structuring um, our instruction so that it removes barriers for kids, so that all kids start at the same starting line. And in our um, professional development day in February, all teachers will go through an intro to universal design. And we've had uh, groups of teachers go to the county for a full two days, and there's more going. And then we're building that into our mini course that we're doing with teachers and administrators as well. The other thing that teams are really doing is is spending more and more time looking at how are the questions built on the tests and how can we mirror those in our classroom. So teams are talking about, uh, about that in alignment, um, both instructionally and with their assessments. Is technology, because the test is all computer. Yes, it is. Have, have we found technology to be a barrier for some you know, are the students able to manipulate and understand how to use the tools that they need to be able to use on the test? You know, it's trickier at, at, at different Elementary, ages, for yeah, sure. Not, yeah. um, but teachers are practicing. I know when they start at third grade, those teachers practice and practice and practice just, right, with how do you manipulate the tools. Um, and we are putting together a list of not content, but do you know how to drop and drag or highlight or so yes we're looking at that and we're, we're trying to put this list of going through the test and saying these are all the techie types of things you have to do so that teachers can practice those as thank well. you yep. um so that's what other questions do you have i had another question about, um some of our some of our sites really have um had an increase with chronic absences of students um, are we doing anything or what are we doing? I know we are doing. What are we doing to address um, absences? Because it's actually pretty, the percentages of our attendance is not as strong no, we, as you would think that it would be, or long, as strong as I think it should be. Let's put it that way. Well, Mr. Ray Hill sends out attendance um, monthly, I believe, right, to each school site, and schools are, are creating goals around that and trying to do uh, perfect attendance awards and outreach um, to families to make sure that kids are in school. We've had a lot of conversation, uh, uh, and though this is an excused absence, but um, around independent studies and the number of kids that are pulled out of school for five or more days to go on a trip or, you know, really great opportunities, but they're not in school and, and the impact of that. Um, and really trying to inform parents and and that the importance of being in school and the impact that it does have. I had a quick question, just a reminder. When we look at these actions going forward, a lot of good things in there. Are, they, are these a lot of things that we just for for, for, for all of us to, to be mindful of? Are they are they in the LCAP? Are some of them are in that? Are some of them in? Maybe not there, but they'd be in school site plans. Yes, and and so some of these are in the LCAP already. Some may end up in the LCAP because these are new. We're constantly trying to think about what else can we do. Um, so not all of these are in the LCAP or the site plans because those were done before some of this work. And then the other piece that we're trying to work on um, is to really decide which ones of these things do we want to put a lot of effort in. Because what we don't want to do is do so many different things that we can't tell what's working. Um, so a conversation that we've had at District Curriculum Council is to put together uh, a K-12 math team and a K-12 English language arts team to start with that do a deep dive, like a pop, I'm thinking of it like a pop-up team where you get together for two or three days and you look at your data, we look at the test, we look at our curriculum, maybe we go on some walks and, and we try to say, where are we, what are we missing? Because we've got a lot of great stuff and it's not for lack of people working really hard. Our teachers are doing amazing, amazing work. And so we need to really 
pinpoint where some of those those holes might be. Yeah, just just yes, and I, just to get back to the attendance. I mean, I I walk and I visit our classrooms a lot, and I see the type of instruction that's going on, and it's really high power, and it's very engaging for kids. So when kids are absent, it's really hard to, for them to capture that experience. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you get a ditto, you get a book to read, and I'm not putting any of that down, but it just, it doesn't, it doesn't replace and it, and it doesn't give you back the experience that's going on in the classroom. I mean, some of what I, what I see, and even when I'm working in the elementary schools, I mean, the conversation, the dialogue those kids are having when they're trying to flush out an idea or trying to brainstorm what they can do with something, you can't replace that in an absent packet. And you can't replace that in a, in a you know, in a, um, an independent study packet. It's just, I would really plead with parents, you know, if your children are well, get them to school. I get there's opportune times for vacations and, and whatnot, but, you know, school time has to be like, it's like your job. You have to be there to get, to take full advantage of it and to, to take advantage of the learning that's going on. Because it's not just what your child is learning, it's the value of that cooperation and collaboration together. And so much of what we do now is in small groups. Right. And there's so much conversation up, around content. And before you write, I'm going to turn to my partner and I'm going to tell you my story and we're going to talk about it that you can't replicate. Right. And the other piece that we've noticed, because we hear the same thing, you go into classrooms and you're thinking, how come when I'm in the classroom, this rich work is going on, but we're not necessarily seeing it transfer. And, and so part of it is teaching kids how to transfer what they're right. doing in the classroom to the testing environment where they have to type. They have to sit there and they have to type a whole. So there's something that could just be lost in that translation right. as well. But it's just, it's, it's very different. The standards are very different now from when we all went to school, where it was very much rote learning. Mm -hmm. That could have been easily duplicated in a ditto, I'm sure, and I'm sure maybe that's what we got. But you can't do it now. This, this is not, these standards are not designed to be that way. They're, they're designed really for that 21st century learning, which is that thinking and then the application of the learning. So they need the experience that's happening in your classrooms. They need to be there to experience that. So, absolutely. Anyways. All right. Well, thank you. We are going to, this is the part of our agenda where we will be t making a motion to approve, and that is going to be bringing up the non-consent item, which is now with um, Ms. Lewis, who is our alternative principal. So, Dr. Beetson, do you want to introduce her and get her going? I sure will. Um, I am get honored to introduce Ms. Kim Lewis to you. She is our new principal of Liberty High School. Sorry. Um, um, each year, all of our school sites are required to write a single plan for student achievement. Um, it is developed with their school sites and their school site councils. They write goals, typically three of them, a math goal, an English goal, and then a school climate goal. Um, and they look at how our students have done in the past, the work that they're doing, and set a new goal uh, aligned with actions and services. And they're very much aligned to our um, strategic plan, our local, our LCAP, our local control accountability plan. Um, and in fact, so much so that um, the single plan template now mirrors the LCAP template in a lot of ways. And so um, uh, last, when the secondary schools all presented at the last board meeting, we were at an alternative ed conference, and so we weren't able to be here. So Kim gets to do a solo show for you. Um, and so here she goes. Thank you very much. Um, Good evening, late um, present new trustees. I'm, oh. I'm right over there. Come see me anytime. Um, Superintendent Young, thank you. Um, thank you, to Dr. Beeson, for that. Um, actually, you explained a lot of my, my slides already, so I can jump right into it. Um, which way am I pointing? Probably right there. Maybe not. 
<laughs> oh God, user error. Cool. Oh. Okay, this is not mine. Oh, here I am. There you go. So, um, like it was said before, we this is our single plan for student achievement, and these were the goals from 2017, 2018. And they do directly align with our LCAP, not only for our goals ourselves, but align to the district's LCAP. And even furthermore, they are, um, I lifted these and have them directly linked, not only to our LCAP, but to our WASC this year, gave me. Um, so we do have some, like it was explained before, we do have some declines in our um, math and language arts. We, have, we didn't quite meet our goal for our chronic absentee rate. And um, from our REACH data, which is a survey given to all the students in spring in regards to relationships, we we're hoping for a growth from 59 to 69. We made it to about 63, which is still an increase of four points. Um, looking at this data and talking with my teachers and talking with parents, with um, I've been pulling in parents and asking them questions and tell me how I'm doing sort of thing. How are we doing? Um, here are some of our goals for this year. Um, I'm not going to read all of those for you, but some of the highlights I wanted to point out was we are at addressing the academic testing. I want to give a big thank you to um, June Regis. She works with adult ed. And sitting with her, and when I was given my data, I was like, oh, what am I going to do? June saddled up next to me and says, we're going to partner together. And with her help, she has a tutor coming in specializing just for math pulling out small groups, three, four kids at a time, ones that are that want to go into the trades, one that want to get into college, and having these, and the kids are receptive. They're like, where's the math guy? I need to go. So we're addressing the math that way. Um, one of my seniors came up to me in the beginning of the year and said, I don't know how to read. Most honest conversation I ever had with a child. And because of that conversation, we are testing every one of our Liberty High School kids on the reading and how we can get support for them. Um, I'm gonna skip down to the absenteeism. We looked at it, we're kind of, we're doing more celebrations with PBIS. We're celebrating, the, I'm so glad you're here today. It's that little things, those little comments to kids that, oh my God, I'm so happy you're cool shoes. Where'd you get your bag? Making those relationship pieces but we're also addressing the social emotional learning piece and why kids don't want to come to school. And so we're wrapping in the new standards from Castle about social emotional learning. Um, and that was one of the big things I got from my parents is that relationship and why kids want to come to school. So while, did I get to first period on time? I'm just glad they got to my school. So if you know my kids, I'm just glad you're here. And so we have to celebrate that. Um, and one of the things on there too is the climate and culture. And we're, my teacher's do an amazing job about the relationships with the kids to themselves. So I'm not too overly worried about making gains on that because my teachers rock. Mm -hmm. But um, it may not sound like it, but I do like data as much as winner. Um, so I asked the kids in surveys. I like their feedback. And one of the most poignant things that has been consistent across the board is three questions. How do you feel I will do well at Liberty High School? My teachers want me to do well at Liberty High School. My peers want me to do well at Liberty High School. And the number one is 96% believe that their peers want them to do well at Liberty High. So that right there, that culture piece, we can love them and wrap them around, but how they view each other that's what we're working on over at my school. Um, the college and career piece, I kind of have a problem with because we don't have the opportunities to make those algorithms click. We don't have classes and AP classes that the computer formulates. So we do something a little different. One of the highlights that we have here, that we're having at Liberty High School is a program called um, LTI, learning through internships. I mean, learning through interest, I'm not internships. Learning through interest. And it's in conjunction with the big picture learning. And it's all about what the kids want to know about themselves. 
how they're, what are they truly interested in? And we're linking them up with partners in the community for internships. My kid, some of my kids got up and spoke in front of the Rotary Club. And some of my kids are talking to the Seroptimists. And some of my kids have been going out and looking at different places and how they really can learn outside the traditional walls of a classroom. And then bringing that back to Liberty High and making projects in saying, this is what I've learned. This is how I can apply it to myself. So I am incredibly excited about this piece right here because this is what makes us special and makes us unique because we are not traditional. <laughs> like you said, I am alternative. And so learning outside the classroom is going to be the thing that I will plant my flag on and say, this is what makes us special. So um, is there any questions? I, don't, I have a question I don't know who would be directed towards. When they talk about chronic absenteeism, what, what is the definition of chronic in terms of the, t you know? I know what that is. <laughs> 10%. 18 days? Yes. Okay. Or more. Thank you. Thank you. So here, your first year, or almost your first year, what's been your biggest challenge? My biggest challenge, I think, like any, is being that instructional leader to get into the classrooms. And it's me personally wanting to do more for my kids. I want to make sure that their social emotional needs are met and they're loved and they know that they're loved and they want to be there. But me personally, it's like, I got to get into classrooms. And I think a lot of administrators feel the same way. I want to get in more. I don't want to answer emails right now. I don't want to answer the phones right now. Oh my God, there's another meeting or another form. Sorry. That's later. I'm, my office manager says, you got to go into classrooms now. And she literally gets me out of my chair and says, go, because I don't like to be swamped down with all the stuff. So being with my kids is my biggest challenge. I want more of them. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I had one uh, quick concluding comment. So really, really well done. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, Ms. Lewis did a report previously on the internship program that she's developing there. Really excited about it. She mentioned briefly, and I'm wondering, and I'll work with Dr. Beetson if we, we, when we build the agenda at a later date, to come back at some point, because we have two new trustees, and I don't, we haven't done this this year, but we've, for the last two years, we've given this survey, uh, which we think it's, it's a good tool. It's called the REACH survey, and it's student it's questions that we ask students at the secondary level, and it covers relationships, expectations, of achievement, cognition, heart, and it, and, it's, and it breaks it down by demographic and grade level, et cetera. I think it'd be nice to bring that back and have a kind of a brief Sure. Uh, report for you guys so you can see what that looks like and how we're you know, yet another tool that we can use to help drive instruction. Sounds right. good. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Lewis. You're welcome. Okay. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So with that said, are there any other comments regarding the single plan for Liberty High School? Do I have a motion to approve? I want to make a motion that we uh, approve the Liberty High School single plan of student achievement for 2018-19. Do I have a second? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the plan passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, coming up next, another um, activity by Dr. Beetson that we are going to be hearing about and then needing to deciding to approve our two new courses. Dr. Beetson. I thought that one was on the agenda. Uh, I thought you were leaving. Huh? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> You're not done. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it's very exciting. We have two new courses that were put forth uh, from Benicia High School. Um, our process for course approval starts early in the year, thinking about what uh, potential new offerings they want to offer next year. The teachers get together, they write the courses, and um, they go to our district curriculum council first, where there's lots of question and answer period of time. Sometimes they send the course back because they want further information. Um, and then once it is supported by district curriculum council, it moves forward to uh, the governing board for approval. So tonight there are two courses. Um, hold on, I'm on out-of-state field trips. Uh, I have dance, thank you, dance two, um, which is part of a sequence. 
We currently have two courses in dance that are a CTE pathway, and this particular dance course would come in the middle of the two of them. So we have dance and then advanced dance, and so this dance course is another course that if you didn't want to be in advanced dance or you didn't qualify for advanced dance, you could still do a two-course pathway if you wanted to. And the other course is NGSS, which is Nash, uh, Next Generation Science Standard Chemistry. And um, over the last two years, we have rolled up NGSS Physics at ninth grade, NGSS Biology at 10th grade, and now they've redesigned the uh, course for NG bless you, for physics, I mean for, I'm sorry, for chemistry. So it is aligned to the next generation science standards, and it has sprinkled in with um, uh, space and um, earth science because we did a, a lightly integrated model, which takes earth and space science and sprinkles it into all the other courses. So tonight I bring you those and um, ask for your approval. I just was curious, with the chemistry, does that take, is there going to be like a chemistry class and then a next generation science? No. So this it's taking the place it. of yes, standards. Okay. updating it and so that it's in alignment with the, the new Excellent. standards and the new test. It is not a requirement at this point. We have a, um, a two-year science requirement, but um, they wanted to make sure that all of their courses were rolled up to see. <laughs> you okay? I am. Whoa. Sorry. That microphone. Thank you very much. So are we going to run into the same situation with the, the, the math, the science? We could. With the math? We could, because there is a science test that students take in the, um, at 11th grade, and it is the CAST, C-A-S-T. Right. It's a new science test, and it does assess students through chemistry standards. And so the science department is also in conversation about how do we do that? Should we look at, you know, revisiting the conversation about requirements for science? All of those pieces. And what's the math level that needs to happen and so forth. So I think, again, I'm going to recommend mm -hmm. that that conversation percolate first with the teachers. Yep. And then, then it would be something that we could address to support them. Okay. Okay. Anybody have any other questions about the new CAS classes? I assume they've identified whatever materials they're going to yes. need. Okay. All right. With that said, can I have a motion to approve the course outlines as presented tonight? I move that we accept the course outlines as presented tonight. Thank you. Do I have a second? second? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, they all pass. Thank Great. you. Very Thank much. you. Okay, the next one, I believe Dr. Beetson's off the lock, and we go to Dr. Gill. When in consideration and approval of an amended 19, 2019, 2020 calendar. 19, Holy cow. 20. I know, I started to say 1920. No. 19, <laughs> oh, my. 2019, no. 2020. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Gill. So, um, good evening, everyone. Welcome, new trustees. Um, we found out um, that there was a technical error with this calendar when it was approved. I believe it might should have been approved most probably somewhere in 2016 or something because we have a tradition of getting, of getting the calendars approved about three years in advance. So, we found that technical error was basically instead of 180 days, it was counting 179 school days and we needed 180 days. So we met, met with our, our committee, amazing committee, um, one of the best committees I've ever, ever worked with. Our calendar committee is comprised of teachers, classified staff, and administrators, about 10, nine, 10 of us, nine of us. And uh, we met, uh, we had, as you can see, this is option G, so we went through option A through F first. <laughs> and uh, just to look at different type, different versions and discussing and discussing. And finally, we all agreed to an option G. Uh, our um, CSEA and uh, BTA unit members have uh, an opportunity to look at this and they have, we have their blessings and they have their approval uh, on this. So even though in the board agenda it says pending approval, but it has been approved and, and they notified that to us already. Um, be beauty of this calendar is um, the school does start on the 20th of, of August. 
Uh, we have moved one of the PD days from September to the beginning of the school year so that teachers, the staff gets the professional development before the school year starts. And the second, uh, two other big changes are in October. October is usually a long month with no break. So October, we worked the calendar in such a way there is a day off in October, long weekend in October. And uh, um, and then the PD day uh, has typically, like for example, this year we're going to have it in February. That also has been moved to January. Um, so... And that's what the teachers, all the staff who was there um, really supported that having that PD day in January will be helpful so that they have ample amount of time to implement what they have learned in, in the school year. And finally, in March as well, we have an additional long weekend. So, um, so there is a, like a break kind of for the students, staff, everybody, uh, and so on. During these pink, pink days, though, our 12-month employees still work. Um, they can take a vacation day or something, but um, uh, 12 months are only, employees are only off during the holidays, and other days they can adjust their schedules according to uh, their work days and so on. Okay, so uh, questions? I have a question. So I noticed on the calendar that the first half of the year is 81 days and the second half is 99. That's correct. So how does that impact the high schools on semesters? Or so, does their new schedule kind of offset that? Actually, um, this uh, gives them one more day in the beginning of the year as it did in the past. Even this current year, if we look at this current mm -hmm. year, the first semester is smaller, much shorter as compared to the, the second semester. Um, they kind of like it, but it would be better if we can have the difference by, is only like 10 days. We, our goal will be in the future to work on something like that. Okay. is is to to still have the second semester a little longer the reason they like it longer because of the ap testing and all the at right. the end of the right. school year yeah. testing all that stuff but this is i agree it is 18 days difference and we, we did discuss this during our meeting the reason we did not want to and make any change in the beginning of the school year was because parents and other people staff might have already made arrangements right some arrangements so pushing a, by a week or something wasn't feasible at this point. But in future years, that's something to think about. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Well, I know that we've tried to start earlier in August so we could be ending the semester before the Christmas, uh, right. the holiday break. And it's been a revolt from the teachers and parents, mainly parents, of uh, starting too early in the summer. And so, and if we start any later, then you got two weeks of uh, losing what you learned because you hate to come back for a week and then next week you have finals. It's, uh, so that's, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Mr. It's, I work obviously teaching in a different district and it's pretty standard. Uh, I've seen, I've been teaching 25 years in the last 10 years or so, just all districts seem to be moving to having the finals before Chris, you know, when I was a kid right. a million years ago that, <laughs> We still went three weeks into January before we had our finals, but everyone's moved there, and it, this is a battle everywhere. If you have unified districts, uh, usually your parents in a unified district, especially with the younger kids, they don't want to uh, start at the beginning of August. If you have high school districts, you tend to have, where it's just high schools, there tends to be more openness to looking at doing that and even in out the semesters. But I think that, yeah, that's this is a... Discussion all over the place in unified districts. So there are some districts we have seen who actually ha are doing that, where they're starting a little earlier, like a one week week before, and uh, and ending actually uh, last Friday of um, May. Right. There's some districts are doing that. And we actually did have a really good conversation with our team that day also. Uh, our teachers did say they are going to go back and kind of do an informal survey of their unit members and kind of see where everybody is. And we are planning to meet again um, in January to look at for future years. So 1920 is done deal at this point, but future years will definitely open to that idea. Excellent. Okay, Thank that's you. That's great. Okay. Any more comments, questions? Okay, with that, I'm going to call for a motion to approve the draft for 2019-20 as presented. I, I move to approve the draft of the 1920 school year as presented. Do I have a motion? I mean, approval. Second. Second. 
All those in favor say aye. Aye. All right. No one opposed? All right. The motion passes for the calendar. Thank you, Dr. Gill. Thank you. You're up again, so I don't get too comfortable. Apparently, we have to have a discussion about a um, waiver request. Yes, so thank you. Uh, we have a um, uh, CTE teachers at the high school um, uh, for medical careers classes, and uh, the teachers working currently working on completing the CTE credential. Um, these days, when somebody is getting their regular credentials, uh, EL authorization is part of the credential, so she is going to complete and get it done. But she does have EL students, so we do request at the board to approve uh, for, for us to do a, um, a variable term uh, uh, request for her so that we can uh, uh, Put that through to the county and then through CTC, uh, which will be for one year uh, for her to, uh, while she's completing her credential. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Gill? Any? Okay. With that, I'm going to request a motion to approve the variable term waiver request as presented. May make a motion that we approve the variable term waiver as presented. Do I have a second? Second. I'm good at the second. <laughs> You're doing just fine. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the waiver passes. Thank you, Dr. Gill. Okay, the next item that we'll be having a discussion and then need to take a pass a motion on is going to be our first interim financial report with Mr. Rahill. Good evening. Uh, yeah, we have our first interim financial report for your uh, review and approval tonight. Um, we start the year off with a, a budget, and then um, throughout the year we have a, a, this is our first interim financial report. We followed up with a second interim financial report in uh, March, and then we wrap up the year with another financial report as we close the books. So this is kind of a check-in a few months into um, the uh, the 2018-19 school year, and we have a series of slides for you with some charts that um, summarizes our uh, financial position in the district. Um, and so this first one is the um, Excel sheet uh, in your attachments. Uh, if you want to click on that, also it's up on the big screen. So in our first interim financial report, we have the revenues that we collect. And then we also report out on how we uh, spend those, uh, what expenditures we have. This first pie chart shows um, our revenues in our school district at $46.3 million. And the biggest chunk of those revenues come from the state of California through their uh, student-based uh, formula, the local control funding formula. And that gives us about $38.8 million, 84% um, of the revenues is that. There's another small piece in the LCFF, the local control funding formula. Uh, that is for uh, supplemental services, and that's about 4% of our revenues. So when we report to the state, um, our students and their attendance, we also report uh, which students qualify in one of three categories, which is uh, in the free and reduced lunch program, who are English learners, or who are foster youth or homeless. So Benicia's, um, we have about 25% of our student population falls into one of those three categories. And because of that, we get um, supplemental funds through our LCFF um, of about $1.9 million. Um, the other revenues come in from the state. Um, we have about 2.2 from the state, about 1.1 from the federal government. And then the local and other um, revenues are about 2.2 million. And a big part of the other local are our special ed revenues that come from our local uh, county special ed group. Um, at the bottom left corner, this is just informational. Um, our LCFF and supplemental funds, um, they come from the state of California. Um, about 61% comes out of the state budget, um, and about 39% of those LCFF, or LCFF revenues are generated by our local property taxes. So that's kind of our local contribution towards that LCFF. And if it doesn't meet the formula, then the state has to backfill that out of their, their budget. So that's an overview of our, uh, of our revenues. Uh, we go on to the next. Uh, 
uh, tab, um, which is our expenditures. And so we're, uh, our expenditures right now are at 47.1 million. Um, we fall into the category of almost all other school districts in California where there's a range of uh, what is spent on salaries and benefits. And that range generally is anywhere between 85 and 90%. It can be a little bit lower, it can be a little bit higher, but we're right at that 85% of our budget is spent on our salaries and benefits. Um, we have two categories of employees, those with certificates, they're certificated main, mainly our teachers, administrators, counselors types, and then our classified staff, all the support folks in our district. Our benefits include not only medical and dental, but also the retirement pensions, STRS and PERS, what they're called, unemployment, some workers' comp, and a few others. Um, the rest of our budget um, is spent on supplies and services and a little bit for capital outlay. So one of the things that um, school districts do, you'll notice that the expenses at 47.1 million are higher than our revenues at 46.3, and um, that's about an $800,000 deficit. Um, but that is due to um, funds that we collected last year and we did not spend last year. And so we refer to those as carryover expenditures, carryover funds that we spend in the current year. And so because we received the funds in prior years, we, we recorded the revenues back then, but didn't spend the money, we report those expenditures now. And so um, there is a chunk of uh, facilities, uh, that facility funds, maintenance funds that carry over about, uh, about 300,000 of that. So a big chunk of that is um, being spent in the current year. Without those carryovers, our school district would be operating pretty much at break even for the 2018-19 year. On the next um, tab uh, for the pie chart, it shows us what, uh, what we have in our fund balance at the end of the school year, what we're projecting to have after we collect the money and spend it. Um, we're left with $6.3 million. And um, we have that breaking out broken out into reserves and then uh, for future carryovers. So we're not budgeting everything that we have on hand to spend right now. Um, the state of California um, assigns a uh, reserve for school districts and we um, are required to have a 3% reserve. That's uh, due to the size of our district. And so that 3% um, is at $1.5 million. So we're projecting we will have that. And in addition to that, um, several years ago, our um, local school board um, uh, created a board policy reserve, um, which would add $2.1 million. And basically those two numbers added together, the reserve of 3% and the reserve for the board policy would be equal to one month of payroll and benefits. Is that so, still accurate? Um, yes, yeah. We keep that floating. As expenditures go up, those numbers go up a little bit too. So um, what's left over are some carryovers for restricted programs, about 272,000, and then carryovers uh, for other one-time programs. The biggest one in that um, carryover uh, for the 2,399,000 is um, the last for the last three years or so, Governor Brown has provided school districts with one-time grants, mm -hmm. funds that are one-time in nature, but they've been awarded for three years. Um, and due to the uh, magnitude of how much that is, our district um, has developed like a three-year plan to try to spend those down. It was just too much to spend in one year. And so we have um, broken that up into three major categories, um, which are uh, technology, um, also professional development, and books and materials. <laughs> so we have a chunk of that budgeted right now, which is um, part of the reason we're op operating at a deficit. We have that carryover in there. But then in the future years, right now there is no proposal to provide one-time funds in the future years. What we've done is decided to bank some of that and spend it in those outer years um, 
on in those three categories. Mr. So because we and one more question mm -hmm. about the reserve. Does what we have in the reserve between the board reserve and the three percent, do we have enough to keep schools open for a month or is it just salary? So that number, um, when we set up the board policy and we put the language in there, it was the equivalent of month one month payroll mm -hmm. and benefits. Um, it didn't say that it had to be used for that. Um, so the intent was to come up with a, um, a number um, that um, the board felt comfortable with, not necessarily to go towards that, but if we had to, we could. Um, uh, if you look at our expenditures, you know, we're almost at um, $50 million. We're $47, $46 million. And so if we spent money equally throughout the whole year, it'd be one twelfth of that. So um, salary and benefits are the majority of our budget. So uh, it would it would be close, um, but you would fall short if you did if you did the math specifically that way. Okay, so we'll keep going through the next um, the next um, tabs um, are some of the highlights that we include in our budget um, and reporting out in our first interim. So one of the things as you as, as um, we continue, we have uh, increasing retirement pension costs for um, for all of our employees the where our employees are either part of the certificated pension or the classified pension and um, both of them are struggling to um, generate enough revenues to uh, meet their needs into the future for future pension costs and so they're charging districts more they're charging individual members more and for the um, for the STRS, the certificated STRS system, the state also kicks in a piece, um, and so they're charging the state more. So um, we're paying about uh, one point eight five percent more into STRS that we would never, what we didn't have to do in the past. And then in the PERS system, you can kind of scan uh, down below. We're paying um, in these later years um, over two and a half percent more. So we have additional amounts paid into those systems that up until 2000, two, up until 2013, 14, the employer rates were pretty steady. And now we're, we're forced to do that, but we need to make those payments and, um, for the benefit of our employees. So when they retire, um, they have their pension checks. I really appreciate the dollar amounts too, because it's one thing for someone to say it's a percentage, mm -hmm. but when you can see in the out years, the actual dollar amounts, you know, you really can see what it means, and I appreciate that. Thank yeah. So, for for an example, if we uh, if we look at that bottom section in PERS, so we've already budgeted the increase for 2018-19, mm -hmm. but um, in 2019-20, just for our PERS group, our classified group, we would have only had to pay a million two hundred and fourteen thousand, but because PERS is charging us two point six four percent more. A, a higher rate, we now have to contribute $177,000 more. So we would, if the rate stayed flat, that would be $177,000 available to us, us for other services, but that's not the case, unfortunately. Um, our next, our next tab, um, it, it lists some of our key fiscal factors. So we have um, a $47 million budget. There's a lot of line items in there, and this tries to capture the big picture items um, that we um, are faced with every year. And up at the top, we, we start with our known salary-related costs. Um, we have increased costs related to salary for our salary schedules. Um, so we have salary schedules where um, our employees can um, move up on the salary schedule, depending on years of uh, experience and or education. And so um, in the outer years, uh, it, it it kind of fluctuates a little bit depending on where our employees are on the salary schedule. Sometimes they move up, sometimes they don't. And so, uh, and it also will depend upon um, retirements. And so for right now, um, we don't have an accurate number for the outer outer years, but um, come January we'll have a better idea because we have a yeah. 
and we can we can update those outer numbers. But for 1920, it's uh, estimated about 468,000. Um, the other big salary costs that we just talked about are those increases for our uh, STRS and PERS pension plans. That's about 613,000 next year. So we have some pretty big automatic salary increases. Um, in the second, um, we look at all of the other kind of big pieces of our budget. There's some changes in special ed. Um, we're hoping um, on the utility side of the house, you, you guys have seen our solar panels up at our school sites, they're doing really well. Um, on a positive note in utilities, they're doing really well and we're seeing some really good savings there. Um, uh, however, uh -oh, our water, however, we are struggling with our water and sewer bills. So we're monitoring that very closely. Um, I have heard that our maintenance crew is going to be out in force tomorrow morning at 4 a.m. <laughs> because um, the new city's water meters, they track water by the drop. And so <laughs> basically, yeah, literally yes. by the drop, yeah. really forcing us to, you know, if we have a leak to really capture it and fix it. So when nobody's there is the best time to, to listen and see if we can find some of that. So um, this month's bill is, is less than that. last month's bill. It still is a little bit higher than the same period last year. So between all of our utilities, we're hoping for, um, for a savings there of, of a couple hundred thousand dollars. How much? Yeah, when there are when there are breaks and and ruptures in pipes, we can call the city and alert them, and they can give us um, an adjustment. So we try to do that whenever we know of a break. Um, how much did our water bill, water sewer bill, increase when with the new meter? Um, let can I don't want to just say something off the top of my head. Let me let me come back with you with that. I can do it at a future meeting or in a board communication, but. Um, yeah, it was noticeable. One of the other things that contributed to it is um, the city was maintaining some of our fields for us and they were taking care of the water when they did that. Mm -hmm. And so now that we've um, re gotten those fields back, we've all unfortunately also got the water fields back too. Yeah. So we'll continue to work with that. Um, this, the, the next section, it, what, what we attempt to do in our outer years is, you know, if we need to make adjustments and squeeze our budget, you know, right now we're, we're about after these other assumptions, you know, just to get to break even, we, we have some work to do to look at um, if there's some other areas that we can make it adjustments of about $281,000. Um, we, we're just starting with that number. It's December. Um, we'll kind of see what our actual ADA comes in at um, to see if, if that is still an accurate number of what we're looking to try to find to get to um, a break-even budget in 1920. Um, I just want to I want to point out too. Um, I'm kind of focusing on on 1920, but um, the first interim report that you're approving tonight it really is the first column um, because uh, that's that's what what's going on right now. But every time we report on the current year, we're also looking to the future to see where we're at. Um, so the interim report basically kind of just updates the original budget a little bit based on what we know. Um, and then what you're trying to do is use that information to see how it impacts uh, your outer year so you can start to plan um, for 1920. Um, I'm gonna just in inject here a little bit. Um, after the winter break, uh, we go to Sacramento um, in mid-January and we will hear um, Governor Newsom's first budget propo proposal for 1920. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll bring that back to the school board in January or February and let you know how that might impact this column. So uh, line 29 in 1920, I noticed that the, I'm assuming that those year are increases when you say the projected LCFF funding, are those increases over the prior year? Which um, which line are you looking? Uh, line twenty nine. Like, is it two point seven million over the prior year? Oh, Before okay. Control yeah, let's uh, let's um, before we get to that. Oh, I'm um, sorry. That, that we're coming right up on that. The section right before it kind of feeds into four. 
Um, num the, the third big consideration we look at is um, basically our enrollment and which ends up in, into our attendance. We get, we get funded based on kids attending school, not just enrolling. And so Benicia's, be, you know, between 95 and 96% of our kids attend on any given day. So that's pretty good. We can always do better. But the big change between our original budget and this is um, our student enrollment declining 125 students. So we were really hoping that that would that our declining enrollment would stop. Um, but our October to October student count is down 125 student, and basically half of that is at the middle school, and half of that is at Benicia High School. So those are real numbers. Um, we're going to meet with um, the middle school and the high school and talk about that um, and, and how that could impact um, you know, some staffing at those two school sites. With, with less students, um, you know, generally there would be less, less staff that would, that would go along with that. So we're, we're talking with them, starting that conversation now. Um, what, what Mark, what you were just saying in number four, the LCFF. So this, I, I purposely put these two, I broke it down like this. So our, without declining enrollment, if we were break even um, in the current 2018-19 year, that would have given us $2,730,000. More than the prior year. More than the prior year. Yes, more than the prior year. However, not only did we decline this year, but we declined last year. And so we didn't get $2,730,000. We got $602,000 less than that. And so we only got additionally 2128 I'm sorry, $2 million. That makes sense. So that middle line there really emphasizes when a district like Benicia declines, we, we lose a lot of money. It's, it's almost $9,000 per student. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's big, big money. Uh, we're tracking enrollment. Um, we're, we're getting, we're, we do uh, monthly disenrollment reports that we share with the principals to let them know why kids are leaving, if they're moving, if they're going to another school just so that we can um, try to get a handle on that. We did a demographic report a couple years ago, which basically said we should be relatively flat um, for a district like Benicia that has, you know, less than 5,000 kids, um, you know, a, a change of 10, 20, 30 would probably be okay, either up or down. But when you get over 100, that's, that gets noticeable. So in um, this is labeled another number four. So, but that's when when you have declining enrollment, we sit down and we talk about how um, how we could adjust staffing. Um, so we did some staffing adjustments this year. Next year, it could be in the neighborhood of um, seven positions of some sort. Um, FTE is full time equivalent. So one FTE is a full time position. And then down at the bottom, we just have what the state cost of living adjustment um, is. Going back to number four, uh, in 1920 and 2021, I noticed the, in 1920, you have a increase of 1.1, 1,117,000. What are you basing? I mean, where do you, where do you come up with that for an increase? Yeah, the state has um, a calculator, an LCFF calculator. The Big Mac. Uh, through FICMAT, yeah. and so we drop in our um, enrollment and attendance numbers, and it automatically calculates the, um, in our case, it um, it calculates the 25,811, okay. um, but what I do is um, I, I back into those other numbers just to, for a visual to show you um, yeah, that 25,811 is what the calculator spits out, but the detail would be a, a, a gross number of 1,117,000 so, subtracting out the, uh, the declining I was just I was curious about where the 1,117,000 came from. I, and I, like you said, you're going in January to hear the, but I'm assuming that could change if the budget numbers come out really well. Yeah, with the January uh, governor's proposal, um, they'll update, the state will update the calculator with whatever numbers, and then we, again, we basically put in our enrollment in ADA and it, it 
and it calculates it for us. And may revise. But we're still out of the hold harmless from a couple of years ago and still going to lose at $1,091,000. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in the uh, that um, million ninety one thousand. Um, so enrollments down one hundred and twenty five kids. We take ninety five percent of that for ADA. So it's one hundred and twenty. So basically, yes. Yeah. We're going to get right. Yeah, the state has a one year hold harmless. So. Um, if by some chance Benicia Unified goes up 125 kids next year, then then that would also uh, erase that million ninety one thousand. But we haven't seen that since I've been here for ten years. Oh. It's been flat or down. Thank you. Um, the next several slides, it just um, kind of it summarizes. Um, uh, our, what our operating deficit or uh, surplus would be over the years. Again, if we're operating at a deficit at this point in time, it's because of the carryovers that we're spending in those outer years. Um, the bottom part of this slide is um, basically showing um, that we have our uh, state required reserve and whatever else we have. And by in doing so, um, we provide a positive certification with this um, interim financial report because we're showing that we're able to um, provide a budget that provides for the 3% reserve um, along and we're in compliance with our board policy. And the other slides are just summarize it in different graph format. So um, I don't need to go into detail about those unless we want to. It just shows it in a different graph and line chart. Um, and then if I I want to I want to go to the PowerPoint, which is just uh, it might be the last attachment in the board agenda. Um, there's some added things in the packet too. Let me go through this, and then we'll I'll tell you what else is in the packet. So basically, our goal with each financial report is to provide a positive financial certification, um, and again, it's based on the, the state's adopted budget and their state's uh, school funding formula, the local control funding formula, which has a calculator provided by the state. We drop in our numbers, and that's what we report. And also, to be positive, we have to have that uh, required 3% reserve. Um, since the local control funding formula is the biggest source of our revenue, that's we pay a lot of attention to that. Um, it's how the state funds all of the public schools in California. Right now, in 2018-19, that um, formula provides $8,854 per student. So we get almost $9,000 per kid uh, who attends our schools. We're just reminded that that dollar amount um, already includes a 20% um, a increase, or it's called that supplemental grant to serve students that fall into one of those categories, free and reduced English learners or foster youth and homeless. I mentioned earlier, we have about 25% of our kids falls into one of those categories. So one in four of our students um, uh, are in one of those categories. Um, in order to receive the LCFF funds, we have to provide a plan. So which is called the Local Control Accountability Plan. And um, Leslie Beetson leads the district in that effort, does a lot of outreach. Um, we are having um, an LCAP uh, work group next Tuesday, which includes the two of us, um, two teachers, one of them who's in the audience this evening, <laughs> and two classified folks. <laughs> You're getting, you're getting a preview of what we'll talk about on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's um, an attempt for us. Uh, that That's a new thing. That's part of the LCAP process. It's also part of, you know, working with our um, employee groups as well. Um, so we'll put that together. Um, it's kind of, so when, what you'll 
see um, starting in January is a six month process um, to uh, get the district uh, a budget for next year and an LCAP for next year. So when the governor comes out with his state budget in January, that kicks off our six month process to put a budget together and an LCAP that's planned together that goes hand, hands in hand um, to June, to the meeting in June when we're gonna ask you to pass a budget for next year. So what we ask you guys to do tonight is review, ask any questions that you have, um, and prove this while we send it to the Solano County Office of Ed and the California Department of Ed for their uh, review and approval. And like we said earlier, uh, Gavin, Governor Newsom will come out with his budget for 1920, and uh, we'll report back that to you guys in January or February, and then the second interim comes in March. Um, in the interest of time, um, there are additional attachments in your packet, um, which we can go through, or we can we can bring that back at another board meeting as well. Um, but the one there's one attachment in there that lists all of the staff. Uh, it has a column for all of our certificated and classified staff. Um, it has a column for what we had last year and what we have this year. So it has um, all of our teachers, um, all of our classroom teachers, special ed, um, other, other types of teachers and counselors. It has all of our certificated management listed, um, all of our classified staff in the union and other um, maintenance and support positions. So in total, if we look just at our general fund, um, for this year we have a right around 400 um, full-time equi equivalencies. Um, so we actually employ more than 400 because some of those folks are part-time. Um, at the bottom, um, there are some other funds that are separate from our general operations. So we have a child care fund for our child care programs. Um, we have um, an adult ed fund for our adult ed programs, and we have a cafeteria fund for our cafeteria program. So if you add those staff, we're actually at about 434 staff. So these positions are included in the current budget. Um, there, is a, there is a page for a supplemental grant. So we mentioned early on part of LCFF, we get um, a piece to help uh, provide services to our 25% of our students in free and reduce uh, English learners or foster youth. And that's about $1.9 million. Um, that's on a separate um, attachment um, in the board packet. Okay. Uh, so that's made up of some teachers, some PD days, some counseling, and some uh, management staffing. So as, pardon, it's not on that one, it's on a separate one. A supplemental, that's it. Isn't that it? Yes. <laughs> so um, as part of our um, LCAP work group, we will definitely be reviewing um, this because um, included in our LCAP and our discussions is how does Benicia receive those supplemental funds and how, what do we use them for? How do we use them to provide services to students? So this is what we're doing currently. Um, and then there's um, two other attachments which provides, or actually three. So there is another attachment which goes into great detail about the supplies and services. Um, and so there's books. Um, I, I think we might want to save that for another time to go into detail. Um, but it gives you an idea of all the different um, aspects like insurance and legal and utilities and repairs and maintenance and special ed. So, but this is something that um, gets broken down on a, a, a big level and then as a detailed level. So you even get to see some of the big software type costs and things like that. Um, the last thing um, in the packet is our um, summary of, uh, we call it, they, they call it cow pads. And every school district in the state has to do an October student count. So they figure kids come back to school, they come, they go, the district gets their enrollment all cleaned up by October. And so we do an official count on um, one of the first days in October. And so that's um, the one that shows you um, we're down from October to October, we're down 125 students. 
And if you just look at the top two lines, uh, Benicia High School down 66 and Benicia Middle School down 58. Mm -hmm. So those are our two focused areas. The other ones, you know, the elementary schools, they go up and down a little bit. You know, one of the reasons why the Benicia High School is down is because maybe there's more enrollment at Liberty. So there's a, a small piece of an explanation there. Um, so yeah, it's it's that's our big challenge. That's what unique, not not solely unique to Benicia, but I think throughout the whole state, the state student population is going down, and most districts um, are going down as well. Vacaville is going up because they have some developments going in up in Vacaville. So. Housing prices play a role, big role. People can afford or not afford to live here. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much, Thank Tim. You. Appreciate it. Anybody else have any other questions for no, Tim? No, that was very informative. Would it be OK? I'd like to request that Tim bring those other two spreadsheets back to us at another time that we okay. can go through them again. Sure. sure. They're, they're also pretty dense, but the detail, I think, is, is worthy to go through so we can really see what the budget looks like. Tim, you did an amazing job with yes, detail this very time. Much so. I really, really appreciate it. Um, but I would like to, if we can get it on an agenda, to bring Tim back with those those other spreadsheets. I think it would be good to go through because then we'll be really up to speed and understand where and how the money is being allocated. I think that would be great. And we can talk more about utilities. How exciting. Okay, so with that said, I need to ask the board if they have no other questions of Tim. If we can get a motion to approve the first interim financial report for Benicia Unified School District. Make a motion that we approve the 2018-2019 uh, first interim financial report for Benicia Unified School District. I second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the, the interim report passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. from anybody up here? This meeting's adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>